Okay, so we have the Anest ND study and Matinib versus Nilotinib, and Matinib versus Dasatinib in the decision trial. Those both studies met the primary endpoint of higher molecular or cytogenetic responses by, by a year um, and, uh, and are now FDA approved. So I'll give my opinion and then we'll, we'll open it up, okay? Um, my opinion is um, my concern about waiting for three to six months is that what happens to the patients who aren't responding adequately during those first three to six months. So if you look at the NSTND study and when the events of progression of accelerated phase and blast crisis occurred, half of the events in the imatinib arm occurred in the first six months. So my concern about a study like that that waits until six months is it's not gonna include a very, very small percentage of patients, but nonetheless a finite number of people who progressed early on because you chose imatinib as opposed to a second generation drug like nilotinib. So I'm coming at it from the point of view of arguing that the difference in progression is the key because we might be curing patients, but what we really know is we're preventing progression and we should use the drug that does that the best and the quickest. And so that's why I would use a second generation, everything else um, being, being equal. So, so my, my approach had been a little bit in, incorporating the risk model. So we look at patients' so-called score. If they are intermediate or higher so-called score, we are more likely to offer them second gen because of what you mentioned. In the lower risk, sometimes, you know, I'm still willing to offer them imatinib, but with the exact point that you should look earlier than six months. I don't think you should wait for six months to look at the endpoint. Maybe a three month is a better option. Then the choice between the other new agents is probably also going to be uh, dependent on some of the toxicity profile for those two agents to whether to select nilotinib or disatinib. That's the other point. I, I found myself, um, we use the SOCOL score also, but to be honest, uh, imatinib is not as well tolerated as the newer agents, at least in, in uh, practical standpoint. The, the patient comes back and immediately finds their life has been rearranged by this. You have this terrible temptation. You've got these second generation drugs that you know are not gonna cause this problem. Uh, that, I think, still is gonna be completely turned on its head uh, if imatinib goes generic, and we're gonna be under tremendous pressure uh, to not prescribe those second generation. So everything we're doing carefully thinking that you really need nilotinib versus imatinib is potentially going to go right out the window. You know, I, I say like if you live in an ideal, ideal world where money is not a problem, we all go for second gen TKI, no question. Just I want to go back to the three months to six months response. Indeed, transformation rate and progression is clearly in favor of nilotinib in NSND compared to, the, to an imatinib. Same data for Dazatib as well at a lower degree. Now that being said, my question is, for the globally speaking, not on individual patient, where I want to switch to nilotinib, I want to save, I want to switch to 100 patients to save maybe five or 10 or less. So my question is, will it be ideal to have more tools that can tell me this patient A, beyond the so-called, is going to be progressed and then save uh, and, I mean, focus on a switch only for this patient. Th those well. may not be disease intrinsic features. Those may be features that are intrinsic to the patient. They may be metabolite polymorphisms or they may be aspects that have to do with their immune response to the disease. So it's going to be difficult to find those markers, I think. So my concern is that the third party carriers out there who are looking at this panel may have uh, um, something to say about which of their patients come to see us in the future. So we'll have to worry about that. But I still advocate for the patient that we're treating. I think the data does show that the second generation drugs have been associated with a lower rate of progression and that should be the, the primary uh, goal of our treatment. An easy uh, question is comorbidities, with how you select between the drugs. Uh, each drug has different safety profile and somebody with COPD, lung injuries, for example, does that may not be the best choice for these patients? Uh, vice versa for metabolic dysfunction with nilotinib. So at least we have, I think we have more drugs on our menu to select from them for the best of the patients. You know, the, the, the one point that wasn't raised, uh, and again, it tips me frequently into uh, moving towards the better tolerated drugs, is as well-established non-compliance leads to disease progression. And it is very perfectly well-established that a patient taking imatinib uh, may not be compliant due to side effects. I remember one of my very first patients I put on I casually was asking him, things are fine, right? Oh, yes, fine. So you don't ever throw up. Oh, I throw up every day. What are you talking about? Um, th this was back when it was the only drug available. You do? You know, uh, so, and that, and he was very compliant patient, but 
there is clear data on compliance, and I can't think of a, a greater reason for a patient to be non-compliant than what we would regard as, oh, uh, it's not that bad. Come on, guys, it's not, it's cancer. Uh, sure, but Especially they... Especially when it's chronic. Tell that to a young person, the disease is not obvious to them, they're yeah. going to be non-compliant.